Yeah. Right, hello. Welcome to uh, a revision stream. That's right. So today we're doing... Today I think we should do chemistry revision. And then tomorrow we'll do English literature and a bit of chemistry. Because English literature part two is coming soon. And it is the big, the big bad exam that everyone is scared of. Because... Obviously, it has electroly not electrolysis, that's chemistry. It has a bunch of poems. It has Lord of the Flies. It has a bunch of awful, unseen poetry. It's the worst. So, you guys can expect a revision stream like that shortly. But for now, let's do some chemistry. First thing I, I want to revise is um, electrolysis. So, we know that... In electrolysis, you have your positive anode and your negative cathode, all right? That's a common fact. So you have your anode, cathode. Um, of course, we can remember this by the acronym P-A-N-C. Um, so that's, that's that, basically. Uh, the solution that is within electrolysis is called an electrolyte and this either has to be molten or aqueous now the reason for that is because the ions need to be able to move to the positive anode of a negative cathode so by putting it in the solutions it allows the ions to move to the correct electrode. I don't know what the, the exact definition, the exact terminology is. Allows ions to move toward electrodes. Particles can only move when in molten or dissolved. The reason for that is because in a solid structure, the particles uh, cannot move, but when they are in a liquid form, they are able to move. That's a common fact. Now, what electrolysis does is it breaks down the ionic lattice, which allows the particles, um, the different elements to go to the different things, all right? Um, now, we can do ionic half equations to kind of explain this in a bit more detail. Basically, ionic half equations are things like, if we were doing electrolysis of magnesium chloride, okay, magnesium chloride, basically, um, it would be, ah, see, so what you would have is magnesium 2 plus and your chlorine negative. Now, um, Oh, chlorine is diatomic, which means it would actually have a 2 there. So that obviously means that your chlorine is going to be attracted to the anode. Your magnesium is going to be attracted to the cathode. Because again, opposites attract. Um, now, this is the important bit that everybody doesn't understand. So I'm going to try and explain it to you guys the way I understand it. Okay. So in an aqueous solution um in a molten solution it will literally just be these two elements here okay but you'll have a magnesium there you'll have a chlorine there all right that's in molten basic as but in an aqueous solution you have h2o because it's dissolved in water which now means you have hydrogen and oxygen in the mix. So how does that work? Well, if, 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 um, let me have a, let, let me just go have a look. So if the, so, okay. So in the negative electrode, it will either be your metal or Hydrogen. Okay. One or the other. And in your uh, anode, it will either be uh, oxygen or your halide. 
Now, this is only in aqueous, because aqueous has H2O, hydrogen, oxygen. Okay. So, how do we know which one? Well, in our negative cathode, it will either be a metal or a hydrogen, depending on how reactive the metal is. If the metal is more reactive than hydrogen, it is put forward, not hydrogen. It is, it is, I don't exactly know the word, but in other words, you'll get your metal if it's more reactive than hydrogen. So for this, you could do a reactivity series, if you remember it. But if not, Mr. McCannum said that you'll only really need to know this for things like copper. Uh, in fact, let me... I wrote it down somewhere. Yeah, here. So basically, it'll either be copper or silver or hydrogen. So obviously, we know that magnesium is more reactive than hydrogen, which means it will be magnesium in this instance. But in some instances where hydrogen is less, re hydrogen is more reactive than your metal, we'll get hydrogen instead. And finally, um, halide or an oxygen. If you have a halide, it'll be a halide. If you don't have a halide, it'll be an oxygen. Uh, okay, so you see here, chlorine is a halide. That means you'll get your halide. But if we had something else like phosphorus, it would be oxygen instead. I hope that makes sense. This is only an aqueous solution because that's where you get H2O. It is not in magnesium. Not in magnesium. It is not in molten because molten doesn't have any water. All right? So in, mol in molten, it's normal. You'll get your chlorine there, magnesium there. But in... Aqueous, a little bit of thought process goes into it. You have to think about the reactivity series, which, as far as I can remember, is please stop calling me a zebra uh, something. Instead, learn how copper serves gold. I think that was it. I think this is hydrogen. Okay, so in terms of reactivity series, if it's copper, silver, or gold, then that's, then hydrogen will be put there. But if it's any other metal, it won't be, all right? That's an easy way to remember. So copper, silver, or gold, um, hydrogen. If it's not copper, silver, or gold, it'll be the metal. So that's that. Now, that electrolysis people hate, I like it. I think it's interesting. It's a bad subject in terms of, like, it's still annoying. There's a lot of things, but that's that, all right? In aqueous, it's either a metal or hydrogen, a halide or oxygen. But this is only an aqueous solution. Um, let me have a look here. So that's electrolysis. Okay. We could also take a, a quick look at neutralization, which you could get many marks for in an exam for stating the obvious. So let's assume here, I mean, look, acid plus alkali. And that gives you water. So an acid disassociates in water to give H plus. Alkali is OH minus, and then obviously H2O. And that's, that's basically that. I mean, the exam question I'm looking at here, literally you get three marks for putting OH minus, H plus, and water. And that's literally that. That's, that's three easy marks. Uh, and I, I feel like a lot of people don't really, like, understand neutralization. But, but just just think of it this way. It's like two complete... Like, if you have your uh, pH scale that goes from, like, 1 to 14, you get something from the acid, you get something from the alkali, right in the middle, you're going to get your neutral water. That's why it's called neutralization. You, you get your, your neutral thing. Which is, which is pretty awesome. Uh, oh, here's something. Here's something that is really interesting, if, if you get a question on it. How would you test um, to see if it's a strong acid or a weak acid? Basically, create, create like an experiment 
to test if an acid that you have is strong or weak. How, how would you be able to do that? Honestly, it was this after school thing with like literally me and two other people. We had no idea. I, I was gonna say neutralization, but uh, you can't really observe neutralization. You, you can't really see if that would make it. But acid reacts with metal. And I can't remember the exact terminology here. Oh, that's literally, yeah, re react with metal. So if I wanted to test whether this mysterious acid is strong or weak, if, if I really wanted to test this, um, I would be able to observe hydrogen gas uh, being produced. Uh, because when an acid and a metal react together, they give a hydrogen gas and a metal solution. Um, I'm not sure the, like, equation for that exactly what it would be, but I am aware that that, that is what happens. And you, and you know what? In an exam, if you get this question, what, what is important to emphasise is if you don't know shit, like, if, if you're still thinking, hang on a minute, uh, what, what experiment would I do to test, you know, I have no idea what experiment you would do to test this, you could get two marks for literally writing the definition of a strong and weak acid. Literally, you write the definition and that is two marks because you're giving context for, like, the, the thing. I think that is incredible. Two marks just for stating the definitions. And if you do know it, then it's four extra marks. So that, that's incredible. So anyways, what you would do is you would test it by observing hydrogen gas being produced. Because if you look at it, uh, the more hydrogen gas being produced, that obviously means it's gonna be a strong acid. The, the common misconception is that, let's assume that this is, these are like tanks full of like water. If we have a strong acid and a weak acid, a lot of people will assume that the strong acid will create you know, the hydrogen plus ions, you know, and then the weak acid will only make one or two. That's not true. If you give the weak acid enough time, it will eventually make the same amount of hydrogen plus ions. The difference is how quick. The strong acid quickly does it, but weak acid needs time. So because of that, you could say that you would count the amount of hydrogen bubbles or use a gas pump to, you know, get an accurate measurement. And a strong acid would produce a lot of hydrogen gas in a shorter amount of time to a weak acid. That's what you would do. Um, strong, strong produces more gas in less time. Um, gas is produced more slower with a weak acid. And one more thing is you should also talk about the conditions. You should talk about how you should keep the temperature the same. And you should talk about how the concentration of water should be the same. But there you go. That is six marks. Two of which you could get even if you haven't paid attention. You could just state the definitions of a weak and strong acid. He is a good one. He is a good one. Why is cesium more reactive than sodium? Now, you, you might be sat there thinking, what the hell is cesium? You know, we haven't done anything with that. That's because it's a group one and it's very reactive. Remember, group one gets more reactive as you go down, which is a complete contrast to group seven, which gets less reactive as you go down. Why is that? Why does it get more reactive as you go down? Is it, you know, what, what, why is that? Well, it's because if we have... Uh, oh, I've done that totally wrong already. <laughs> group one only has one electron in its outermost shell. Okay. Which means in a reaction, it only needs to lose one electron in order to react. A group seven needs to lose seven electrons, which of course is more difficult to do. So it only needs to lose one. And this is the same for any group one, literally. One. 
But an important thing to understand is, notice how the nucleus is a positive charge. Because think, you have your protons, which are positive, your neutrons, which are neutral. It's a positive mass in the center. Okay? Electrons are negative, which means opposites attract, you have your electrostatic force. And to begin with, this electrostatic force is going to be strong. Like right here, uh, an electron there is going to have a strong electrostatic force. But as the shells go on and on, and the distance between the electron and the shell increases, the electrostatic um, charge, electrostatic force becomes weaker, which means it is easier for this electron to be lost. Furthermore, the only thing you need to say in your exam to get another mark in this question is that shielding occurs. Literally just says shielding occurs and you'll get one mark. I don't know what shielding is. I'm assuming it's because the other electrons are making it more difficult for the charge to, uh, you know... A, the forces to attract. I'm not too sure, honestly. But literally, if you just put shielding occurs, you'll get a mark. Um, so yeah, outer electron has a further away attraction to the positive nuclei. Oh, and you should also just talk about the number of shells. There are a lot of shells in cesium, which means that it is going to uh, be further away. So that's all you need to say. Cesium has more shells, so the electron is further away. It only needs to lose one electron, and the electrostatic forces are weaker because of that distance, which means it can be lost easier, meaning shielding occurs. That's literally all you say, and that could be four marks in an exam for talking about why group ones are reactive. So there, uh, we've gone through electrolysis, we've gone through neutralization. Let me go look at some other exam questions here and let me try and explain them as best. Oh, you could talk about um, ionic bond, okay? So if we have sodium, which is a group one, and chlorine, uh, which is a group seven, um, the sort of, so we're, we're assuming like it's, they're going to react, all right? Um, how, how would that occur? Well, basically, you, if you guys don't know, this is the one where um, the one with less electrons basically gives the electrons to the other one, except it's, it's a little more like, you know, better worded than that. Basically, sodium will lose an electron which means it gains a positive charge, um, and chlorine will lose, will, will gain the electron, and will gain a negative charge. If people seem to be a bit confused by that, like, why does it gain the opposite charge? Well, think about it. To begin with, you have the same amount of protons as you do electrons. If you lose an electron, you now have more protons than uh, electrons, and as we all know, a proton is posit a positive, the nucleus is positive, which means it'll gain a positive charge. And vice versa, if it's more electrons, they're negative, so it has a negative charge. Anyways, um, so it gains, it loses, which means it, it becomes a positive ion, and vice versa. You should also talk about how chlorine becomes a chloride ion. Um, because it becomes negatively charged. You should also just talk about how they get a full outer shell. The fact that now both of them have a complete outer shell. Uh, like so. Very cool. And also, just to get maybe one or two bonus points, just talk about the size. So say how this one loses... One electron, which means it gains a plus one charge. 
This one gains an electron, which means it gains a negative one charge. Literally take one second to do that, and it could be worth an extra point. Oh, a lot of stuff here. Oh, our favourite, the one that we've literally been doing since day one, but is actually kind of different to how I initially described it. This is how to make pure dry crystals, which is a required practical. Let me go lift that up a little. So how would you make pure dry crystals? Well, you would put, put your reagents into a beaker. Now you have to state what the reagents are. So I don't know, sulfuric acid um, and magnesium oxide maybe. Next, uh, you should use excess magnesium oxide so that it reacts with all of the acid. Next, you would heat it up to increase the rate at which it reacts. Uh, you should also state what thing you're going to use, like how you're going to heat it up. So a Bunsen burner, heating it gently. You don't want to like incinerate it. Next, you want to filter it. Again, specify what, using a filter funnel. Which removes the excess magnesium carbonate, oxide, sorry. Basically removing the excess. Next, you want to evaporate it, but only to a certain point. You want to evaporate it so that most of the water is removed, but not all of it. Um, and then finally, crystallize by leaving it out in sunlight to remove the excess water. And finally, you want to pat dry with a paper cloth. And that's how you do it. And that, that is literally like six marks for explaining crystallization. Next... Uh, graphite, the structure of graphite, which I, I love. It's, it's, it's really funky, right? You have like, I don't know. I, I can't really draw it, but it, it's like little churns. But the way, the way graphite kind of works is it only has three bonds out of four. Because think, carbon has four electrons in its outer shell which means it can go ahead and get four more. So it can make four bonds. Here, it's only using three. What, what does that tell you? Well, it means it's gonna have a free delocalized electron. And this electron is free to move around the structure, making graphite be able to conduct electricity. Um, furthermore, uh, you could ask why graphite is soft. You could be asked that. Well, why is graphite soft? Well, the atoms are in layers. Like so. Which means they can slide over each other. But also because there are weak forces between the molecules. So they can slide, but also they're, they're weak. Weak forces. And again, they can conduct electricity because, like I just said, only three out of four of the bonds are used. They have a free electron which can conduct electricity. Oh, and then diamond. Diamond is very weird. I, I can't particularly draw this one because it's a 3D, 3D kind of thing. But it's like that. And what you should talk about with a diamond is that it's hard, very hard, because all four bonds are being used. So you know how we just said that carbon three out of four, uh, sorry, graphite three out of four, this is four out of four, which means the bonds are strong. More energy is required to overcome these forces, which means it has a high uh, melting and boiling point. It's strong. Each bond is strong. Uh, fullerenes, uh, in case you get asked about them, it's a hollow nanoparticle made out of carbon. An example could be carbon-60. Um... Oh, 
Oh, the definition of an element is a substance made out of one kind of atom. I did not know this. Well, I, I know what an element is, but the specific definition of it, nobody in the class knew. And then obviously a uh, isotope is an element with with different number of protons, sorry, different number of neutrons, same number of protons. Here's a good one. And this one may take a bit of visualization. Okay, why does chlorine have a low melting point? Why? Well, we know that chlorine is diatomic. So we can visualize that by having two chlorine bonded. Now think about that. That makes this a simple, simple covalent. Yeah, a simple covalent molecule, because it's just two of the same. Simple covalents, as we all know, have weak intermolecular forces, which means there is less energy required to overcome um, the bonds between the molecules. Remember, uh, group seven and stuff are diatomic. Uh, explain why neon is unreactive. Uh, refer to electron structure. Electron has, uh, sorry, neon has a comp I can't remember what neon structure is. I'm assuming it's 2A. But neon has a complete outer shell, 2A. This means that none of its electrons can react, meaning it's unreactive. Oh, okay, but the correct... Wording there would have been, has the electron structure 2 it, which is what we just said, meaning it has a full outer shell, it is already stable and cannot react. So yeah, full outer shell, uh, talk about its electron structure, it's already stable so it can't react. That could be four marks in an exam there. Metallic bonding, the final thing we'll do today. Metallic bonding is interesting in my opinion. The way it works is that me metal loses metal loses an electron in order to gain a positive ionic charge. Wait a minute. It's positive. It loses an electron. That means there is a sea of delocalized electrons. That allows it to conduct electricity. But also, you should talk about how... So yeah, in this big lattice, metallic lattice, uh, all the atoms form positive ions. There are, you know, a sea of delocalized... You could, in an exam, literally get two marks for drawing the structure of a metal. Literally, just draw some positive ions... Draw some electrons around, label them. Literally just do that and you get some marks. I'm not too sure what else you could say. Um, oh, you could talk about they have a high melting point because there is an electrostatic force between, you know these uh, molecules, which means it's harder to overcome. But there you go, guys. We have been live now for half an hour, and we have gone through something that Mr. McCannon went through in about an hour and a half. Um, we went through ele electrolysis in a lot more detail. We, we've done a lot to the So guys, give yourself a breather. I know I am. Literally half an hour of chemistry, and you guys probably now know Probably a lot more than you did. I know a lot of this stuff was just me regurgitating information from Mr. McAdams' lesson. But guys, think about it this way. Um, you know, it is what it is. I'm just going to go tidy up now. Because I'm uh, going to be doing some stuff later. But yeah.
There you go. Uh, I'll stay on for like two more minutes, just in case anybody wants to say anything, anyone wants to talk. Again guys, uh, I do these streams daily. I literally dedicate my life to bloody revision and stuff, because, you know, the, the grind never stops, technically. It never does. I have a lot more chemistry, papers and stuff here. I have this whole worksheet of stuff that Mr. McCann printed specifically for me and Dylan and TJ, which is literally what I've just gone through in today's lesson, uh, except in a, ta I, I, a tad more detail, some stuff not as much. Oh, here's a metallic bonding thing, quickly. In the lattice, all metals form positive ions. This means outer electrons are delocalized and move in between the positive ions. The electrostatic attraction between the ions and negative electrons hold it together. That's what you want to talk about. But yeah, that's all I'm doing today, guys. Uh, so stay healthy, healthy and surf. Uh, join me later today where I'll be going through Lord of the Flies quotes, things like that, because I am very much aware that English literature might be more intimidating than the chemistry exam for some people. It is, after all, you know, quite a a, a chunky bit of uh, an exam. I am aware. I'm just tidying my room right now. I have so many bloody things that I can bin now. But, I don't know. Obviously, the biology exam is not until next week, which is great. Next week, uh, next month, technically... It's in, like, about 20 days or something, which is great. That literally means that I no longer have to worry about biology for the minute, which is good. I can focus on other stuff. A little less, incom a little less convenient, however, is the fact that we now have chemistry and literature part two. But anyways, guys, stay happy, healthy, and safe, and I'll see you in a bit.